Welcome to our program, Health Affairs from A to Z, empowering consumers to make good health choices. My name is Nancy Valentine, and I am a professor of nursing at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Nursing and also associate dean at the College of Nursing. And today we have a very interesting program that is going to be entitled Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Do you ever grow out of it? So we're going to be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder across the life spectrum. But particularly because people are getting older, we're going to find out that there is really more post-traumatic stress disorder than we really ever thought there was going to be in the past. So I want to let you know that this is all part of the Mental Health Awareness Month. The whole month has been dedicated to really helping consumers to understand more about mental health issues. And our guest today that is going to be very helpful in helping us to understand that is Dr. Marsha Snyder, who is a colleague of mine at the College of Nursing. So welcome, <laughs> Marsha. I want Thank to tell you, you a little bit about both of us. When we say that we're doctors, we are doctors of nursing in that we both have a PhD and we are registered nurses. And a lot of people in the consumer world don't know that there is this nursing group out there that have really married science and practice and education. And our goal is to share some of that information with you today. So I would like to give you a little bit about uh, Marsha's background. Who Marsha, first of all, is a right. native Chicago, and she just shared with me that she grew up and was raised on the south side of Chicago, and she has made a tremendous impact on psychiatric nursing, not only in Illinois, but throughout the country. She is very well known in, in our field. So she is going to be uh, talking today about post-traumatic stress disorder, but she is really drawing from her knowledge because she works in an integrated healthcare practice here at Miles Square Health Center in Chicago, part of UIC Medical Center. And she's going to tell you through the course of this discussion what an integrated healthcare center uh, does and the kind of work that she does. She treats mainly women who suffer from depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So she is drawing from mm -hmm. actual cases of people that she sees on a day-in and day-out basis. She also has a lot of knowledge about the VA and, and some of the really good and groundbreaking work that they are doing there. She is, in addition to her clinical practice, she is also chairing and, and in mm -hmm. charge of our educational program at the College of Nursing. Correct. Because we'd like to have a lot more people go into advanced psychiatric nursing to do the kind of work that Marcia and other people are doing. So I would like to uh, thank you for being with okay. us today, Thank Marcia. you. I appreciate you having me. Well, well, it's, it's just good to be with a friend right. and colleague. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, many of you may know what PTSD is, but not everybody does. So I asked Marcia really to start just from the really beginning part of this discussion and tell us what is PTSD? What does it look like? What's the definition of it? So that we all have that common understanding before we go okay. into the application of how it's treated, what are the different options, what's happening as we get older. So thank you for, for starting us out with that. Well, you know, PTSD is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying event. Either a person experiences it personally or they observe it in another person. Uh, the, you know, the symptoms are, you know, very strong. They're unwanted memories that you know, um, that the event triggers, such as bad dreams, and they have emotional numbness, intense guilt, uh, worry, angry outbursts. Um, they feel on edge, and they avoid thoughts and situations that are related to that, that event. Uh, the American Psychiatric um, Association Diagnostic Statistical Manual recognized that PTSD is a psychobiological problem that can affect survivors, um, not only those who had combat experience, but you know people who have had um, experience with terrorist attacks, when we think about 9-11, um, natural disasters, um, serious accidents, car accidents, in fact, are um, put people at risk for PTSD. Right. Can, I, can I stop you right there, though? Yes. That big word, psychobiological, can you break that down for us? Well, it's, it's a psychological problem as well as a biology problem. We're going to talk a little bit about the brain. And it is a brain disorder. So as you're well. saying it's not just in your head, meaning that it's, it's an emotional 
right. reaction. Absolutely. But you're saying that there's actual physical changes in your brain? Yes. Yes. That would be very interesting mm -hmm. to learn more about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, people who have been exposed to events as children is, is um, you know, particularly, um, you know, these are people at risk. Um, and, you know, symptoms, if left untreated, can lead to other problems such as drug use, alcoholism, um, tobacco dependence, um, unemployment. And so, you know, early detection is really important. So let's talk about that early detection because I'm thinking, you know, the south side of Chicago, where you grew up, is now really in the news, in the national news, almost right. on a regular basis of all the trauma. So we must be experiencing a lot of collateral trauma with the families, the other children, with violence, not just in Chicago, but mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. So this can start very young. It can start very young. But the problem is we don't really have any good data in terms of the effects of PTSD on children. Okay. Um, and we know that kids are being affected in terms of family violence, uh, the violence that we see on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when you think about people who are involved in gangs, um, certainly that's, you know, most of the research has been done on our veteran population who have been exposed to war. But when you think about gang members, that's war on, on right. our streets. Right, right. So it's domestic uh, war. Domestic war. Right. So, yeah. So, so when you say early detection, that sounds like a good idea. But if there are all these events that can trigger this, should we be making an assumption that, that a person's going to have PTSD if they've been involved in any way with this? Or do we have to wait till they have symptoms? Uh, no, I think that part of the problem has to do with um, protective uh, measures that um, people have, particularly, you know, if, if a person is married, um, if they have supports, they're in better shape. Um, and if you don't have pre-trauma in your background, but it's the repeated traumatization mm -hmm. that puts a person more at mm -hmm. risk. So I think what, what I'm hearing Marcia describe to us is that you can come with some insulation to this yes. if there are certain sociological factors or personal factors that, that you have. So let me just see if I can walk through some of those. So for instance, if you have a good marriage, a spouse, a partner of, of some type, that's really helpful, or a family member, or maybe a, mm -hmm. a church, synagogue, anybody that is yes. in that larger community that can rally around you, your family, uh, loved ones, when there is such a trauma, that is an, in some ways a therapy in itself, um, that it really helps to protect. It may not mean that yes. you'll never have any reaction, uh, that you won't have some degree of PTSD depending on the severity of the experience, but it at least gives you a leg up, so to speak. On, on not having a long-term consequence of this. Right, and we talk about pre-traumatic uh, factors that are, you know, childhood and emotional problems uh, before age six, low socioeconomic status, uh, lower education, prior exposure to trauma and this repeated exposure, uh, lower intelligence, uh, minority status, um, family psychiatric history all put you at, at risk, and certainly female gender. Women are more at risk than men. Why do you think that is? Um, there's some insulation in terms of some of the brain structures that um, actually men have that women do not have. Oh, well, we can't wait to get to those pictures yes. of the brain to understand what that's <laughs> all about. Absolutely. And then, of course, there's uh, the factors that include the severity of the trauma. I mean, again, observing or, or seeing something occur, like, say, 9-11, is different than being right there in, in the traumatic event itself, being raped or molested or, you know, something that was very personal to you. Right. And then, of course, then it's what affects everyone then is how we tend to think about the event. And so if a person is very negative and um, has not, not developed good coping uh, strategies, um, you know, and th then they're not able to then rally when, right. when faced with adversity. Right. So I think one of the key points that Marsh is making is that but just by being alive and, and yes. experiencing life, you're at some right. risk for ex having PTSD. But we do mainly hear about it around combat veterans, returning combat veterans. There's been a mm -hmm. lot of 
interplay with the VA around their uh, treatment, their interventions, all of which I think have been major steps forward. And a lot of that information is good for the public. I mean, some of those same strategies and treatments can be used for anyone. But I think that one of the takeaways from this discussion is that you may know someone that is already uh, experiencing this that never saw uh, a battlefield, right. but they've, they've had a battlefield of their own. So I'd like to open this up um, for callers and hear about your stories and your experiences and some of the questions. So I think we have our first caller on the line. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I have a question concerning uh, if you were to, a lot of people who have a traumatic experience, they're told to get over it. Or it's, you know, this is something you should be able to get over. And so maybe a lot of people don't actually want to say that they're affected by something traumatic. Right. And so in terms of dealing with that, if you see a friend who's had, a, you know, a traumatic experience or a neighbor or a family member, how can you start that conversation? Because they might not want to tell you that it's affecting right. them. I think that's a very, very great call to start out the next phase of this conversation. And one of the things I would just like to mention in response to that, and then I'd like Marsha's expert opinion yeah. as well, and that is a lot of mental health issues get that response. Yeah, if someone say, is yes. ver very deeply depressed or they have some other kind of problem that we're not necessarily labeling as post-traumatic stress disorder, because we feel helpless often and we don't understand the problem and we don't know what we can do to help that person, so one of the things that I think the average person has as a response is just get over it. How hard can it be? Uh, you know, time has gone by. You should be feeling better by now. It's really just because of our own ignorance. So that's, that's part of the problem right there. And that's part of why this Mental Health Awareness Month is really stressing that we need to have more information and more guidance and more understanding of mental health in general. But I'd really like... Marcia, then, to weigh in on this uh, post-traumatic distress disorder application of that. Well, I think part of the problem has to do with people need to be ready to, to do something. And I think that particularly when family and friends may be t saying to them, get over it, you know, how to just snap out of it, um, it that, that isn't helpful. Um, and I think it, it's just recognizing the symptoms and, and that this is not normal, that this is not something that you have to, um, you know, endure. And one of the big problems that people have, of course, is sleep. Now, no one is sleeping, and that includes people who have PTSD, but it is those nightmares and um, feeling uncomfortable in, in your own skin and feeling... Um, unsafe in your own house that I think is most disturbing. So I think what you're saying to the caller is you as the as the traumatized person right. needs to take some action yourself yeah. to get help. Yes. And how do people do that? I mean, what is the usual, from your clinical experience, what are the usual pathways to that? Well, I think particularly now with our insurance carriers, the idea is to go through your primary care provider and, and talk, uh, talk about what's going on and get a referral to a mental health professional, such as, you know, like myself right. or someone else, uh, to get an assessment and figure out what is the real problem and, um, you know, get the treatment that you need. Right. Yeah. So I think that uh, in terms of next steps, I think for a person that has had this kind of experience, and it may not be immediate that they have these symptoms, is to really know and understand that these are not normal, uh, that it right. is not something that is because they are a weak person or any of, the, of those kinds of uh, against self kind of comments, that, that to recognize if you had a fever and it ever went away, you would want to get some help for that. Um, so this would be the same kind of idea that those kinds of symptoms that Marsha was talking about, recurring thoughts, you know, inability to sleep, you know, feeling that, that, you know, for certain situations, that they can, a person can hear a sound that was associated with that trauma, and it, it's the sound that would be completely unrelated. It could be something in the course of daily life that just triggers those memories, again, because they're very deeply held. To understand that that person does need help, or if you are a family member or friend, instead of saying just get over it, recognize it, ask yes. more questions about, you know, what is it that you're experiencing, and help that person to get some help. So maybe you could tell us now about some of the physiological uh, aspects right. of this. I think it would be really interesting to know more about 
what actually happens to a, a person's brain when they have these problems? So when you think about, I mean, again, this is not just a psychological problem. It's a, it is a brain problem because um, the brain is in charge. And so we're yeah, going to try that down yeah, a little bit. Okay, yeah. we're going to put it down to this next one. Okay, hopefully you can read that, but Marsha will point out the different right. relevant sections of the brain. So really, PTSD is associated with changes in brain function and structure. And so the three um, areas of the brain that are really involved is the basal ganglia. You can see that here at the top. All right, it's that blue. That out. That's that That's blue. It. Okay, that first blue of section. all, you've got to explain to people. This is your brain right at the top here. This is the base of your brain. It's the back of your head, between your head and your neck. And this is the brain, what they call the brain stem. Going this down goes, the spinal cord. Goes down your spinal cord. Right. Okay. And then, of course, this is the frontal area where, of course, our thinking and thought and problem solving comes into, into play. Um, so anyway, we have these three structures, the basal ganglia. Which is this blue area here. Right. And what's that in charge of? That's in charge of um, uh, movement and reward. What's that mean? Reward. Well, our reward is, it's again, we, where a lot of chemicals are produced that then make us feel good. Okay. Or so this is otherwise. your feel-good feel area of it's your brain. Your, right, okay. exactly. And then we have the, um, the limbic system, which is really in, in, includes the thalamus, the hypo, uh, hip, hippocampus, with, which has memory, the amygdala, amygdala, which has emotion, and the hypothalamus, which le regulates our body functions, which again gives you that uh, the, you know those experiences that you have when you're you know have a lot of fear. So you're saying that all these colored areas of the brain, right? These are all affected in some way, or shape, or form exactly. by the trauma. That doesn't mean that you had your head hit. It means that whatever happened to you, whatever you visually saw, heard, experienced, it gets, gets stored in this. These yes. all these parts of the brain. That's a big part of the brain. It's the, it's the central part of the brain. Right. It's the central part of the brain. And this, as the information comes into this system, um, the basal ganglia then provides a threat assessment and, it re, and relying on sensory input. So this is why when, you know, uh, there may be a trigger in the environment that sets this whole thing off. So that, you know, the, what, what the person is doing is not... Um, cognitively appraising the situation is more of a sensory experience and so it's really unconscious it's rapid and it's automatic so okay. that I think that's really important for people to understand because this gets back to the point of it's not your fault um, <clears throat> well, and you don't have control over it and you have no control over it so right. I mean when you said it's not cognitive that means you're not saying I saw this horrible thing, or I experienced this horrible thing, and I'm thinking about it so much that it's changed my brain. It's more that these events have happened, and you're, and it's almost like lightning that right. it goes through it's your brain, and your brain is like permanently altered. All those parts that we just showed you, they get affected. How exactly all the physiology physiological experiences and back of that, that's for a different show with a scientist that can really right, give us right. all that. But we know as clinicians that, that those parts of the brain are what are affected and, and basically after that you own it. It's all part of you. It's not something you can wish away or think away, right? Right. Oh, absolutely. And so the next one, I mean, I think this, this picture tells the story. Okay. Is that, we got to get a little closer there. Okay. Yeah. It's not the, what happens is the executive function or the thinking part of the brain is disengaged. And we are all about sensory feeling, and so it's this fear and flight that's engaged. Mm -hmm. And so the person feels like they need to run. And they're sitting in their living room, and it, it, it's, they, they can't even feel comfortable, you know, when you relaxing. Say, I, I want to hear more about this. When you say the executive system uh, part of the brain, the frontal part of the brain... Where thinking occurs, where problem solving. It's disengaged. It means that it just can't put the brakes on the rest of it? Right, right. There's no uh, rational thinking that's occurring. Right. And that's actually where treatments come into right. play, is to get this back engaged. Okay. So this part... Is right here is, is really mapped over what you just showed us previously right. and that's all those other areas that are affected so once that physiological uh, change happens in the brain then your uh, response again reflexive response is to like run away or have these dreaded fear absolutely okay okay that's very helpful to really be able to see that and so again with treatment 
we can get the executive function back in gear again. Now that's important. So you're really buffing yes. up. Let's put that back up. Oh. So let's let's we're, just show this again. So I, I think the visual is <laughs> the visual is helpful because most people don't look at their brains, right? No, so they don't think we, about they don't think how about this it, right? how it's involved. So you're saying that because this is so impacted and right. is like and automatic sort of, and and is like working on high gear, absolutely. And high gear, that when you're talking through and helping people to remember in a in a good way, helping them to experience their their fears and talk about them that this that the cells at the cellular mm -hmm. level in this part of the brain get stronger right and they reactivate and so then we start to yeah in, engage problem solving and thinking again very good and step away from the fear and flight and be able to tolerate well, that, now that alone with those pictures, really gives you an idea that it's not just talk therapy for talk therapy's sake. This is actually right. helping your brain to heal from a traumatic experience, no matter how long ago that mm -hmm. traumatic yes. experience may have occurred. So I think what we're going to move to next is, okay, now we have a bit of a better understanding of the basis of this uh, disorder. What can we do to get treatment? What would be the best pathways for people to go? You already talked a little bit about that. First of all, acknowledge in yourself that you've got a problem. That is step one and really a critically important well, step. And again, I, you know, when you see your primary physician, to ask for a referral. Right. Our large medical centers do have, um, and particularly in our own uh, practice, which is integrated, and we're moving more and more towards integrated um, systems of care, where, again, mental health is a part of um, health care in, in entirety. And so to get a referral to a behavioral health uh, specialist, right. whether it be a psychiatrist, an um, advanced practice nurse, social worker, to help you know, get the ball rolling. Right. Are there specialists with post-traumatic stress disorder? Uh, well, I think that the specialists are primarily with the VA, since they have done so much research and um, that's where they have done most of that, mm -hmm. that work. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about medications? Is there a role for medications in this? Well, absolutely, because I think medications help give you a jump start so that you're not so overwhelmed by all of your symptoms. So that uh, we have selective serotonin inhibitors, which are antidepressants. Um, they're very effective to help um, block some of this fear experience mm -hmm. so that the person can then begin to engage in um, a cognitive therapy. What's that? Um, again, this is therapy to work on your thinking. You okay. Get it, get it in gear. And also, um, in terms of some of the desensitization kinds of therapies, I mean, if you're so fear-ridden, you're not going to be able to engage in any kind of therapy. So tell us a little bit about what desensitization therapy well, is. Desensitization or exposure therapy um, is where the individual is offered in a safe environment opportunity to re-experience the trauma. Mm -hmm. And the VA is doing some interesting things in terms of some visual kinds of activities where they re-experience that war, war right. event. Um, but for, for a person who had been raped or uh, molested on the street or in a car accident, you know, it's more just really having an exposure kind of experience to right. that, that, that event. Right. You can see where even having that discussion may sound at first glance like it was bad enough when I experienced exactly. it the first time. I certainly don't want to be talking or thinking about yeah. it again. But I think what Marsha is trying to uh, discuss is that in a safe environment, it may be one of the crucial first steps to being able to understand all the different components of that event. Often, some of the themes that come out of this is that mm -hmm. the person may feel guilty or somehow they provoked the situation or it was their fault. And once it's dissected, you understand that it really wasn't that person's fault. It was, again, a whole bunch of different extenuating circumstances. Or that, that you purposely put yourself in an ex a situation where you were you know, molested. Right. I think that that's what people, they, they get into self-blame. Right. Or in terms of war, that somehow you didn't do enough for your, your buddies. Right. So much of the, um, the yeah. theme that comes out of this is really helping people to deal with their guilt um, and, and also to help people with their depression. So many times people will be depressed for many, many years and not even put it together 
that it was related to this early event or some mm -hmm. intermittent event. And we didn't get a chance to talk about it today, but there's a lot of implications for our elderly. And we will have a discussion about that in the future. But I want to thank Marcia for her time thank today. You. Yes, and thank you. Thank all of you for listening. Have a wonderful evening.